This morning we continue reading from the large catechism of Martin Luther regarding the second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Besides this, you must also know how to use God's name rightly. For what he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, he wants us to understand at the same time that his name is to be used properly. For his name has been revealed and given to us so that it may be of constant use and profit. So it is natural to conclude that since this commandment forbids using the holy name for falsehood or wickedness, we are, on the other hand, commanded to use this name for truth and for all good. Like when someone takes an oath truthfully, when it is needed and it is demanded. This commandment also applies to right teaching and the calling on his name in trouble, or praising and thanking him in prosperity, and so on. All of this is summed up and commanded in Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. For all this is bringing God's name into the service of truth and using it in a blessed way. In this way, his name is hallowed as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Now you have the sum of the entire commandment explained. With this understanding, the question that has troubled many teachers has been easily solved. Why is the swearing prohibited in the gospel against Christ, St. Paul, and other saints often swore? The explanation is briefly this. We are not to swear to support evil, that is, to support falsehood, or to swear when there is no need for use. But we should swear for the support of good and the advantage of our neighbor, for such swearing is truly a good work, by which God is praised, Truth and right are established, falsehood is refuted, peace is made among men, obedience is rendered, and quarrels are settled. For in this way God himself intervenes and separates right and wrong, good and evil. If one party swears falsely, he lives under this judgment. He shall not escape punishment. Even if this judgment is delayed a long time, he shall not succeed. So everything he may gain from his falsehood will slip out of his hands. He will not enjoy it. I have seen this in the case of many who perjured themselves in their wedding vows. They have never had a happy hour or a healthful day, and so perished miserably in body, soul, and possessions. Therefore, I advise and exhort as before, that with warning and threatening restraint and punishment, the children should be trained early to shun falsehood. They should especially avoid the use of God's name to support falsehood. For where children are allowed to do as they please, no good will result. This is clear even now. The world is worse than it has ever been, and there is no government, no obedience, no loyalty, no faith, but only daring unbridled people. No teaching or reproof helps them. All this is God's wrath and punishment for such lewd contempt of his commandments. On the other hand, children should be constantly urged and moved to honor God's name, and to have it always upon their lips for everything that, they, that may happen to them or come to their notice. For that is the true honor of his name, to look to it Call upon it for all consolation. Then, as we have heard in the first commandment, the heart by faith gives God the honor to him first. Afterward, the lips give honor to him by confession. This also is a blessed and useful habit, and very effective against the devil. 
terrible and shocking disasters would fall upon us if God would not preserve us by our calling upon his name. I have tried it myself. I have learned by experience that while the sudden great suffering was immediately averted and removed by calling on God, to confuse the devil, I say, we should always have this holy name in our mouth, so that the devil may not be able to injure us as he wishes. Thus Luther on the second commandment. Please stand as we sing as the canticle. In 941, we praise you. 
Whoa. 